Um, and then there are again some interesting cases where you have you know, of capital punishment that goes as one as of the death penalty. And uh, the last one is kind of interesting. You have here in the long run, and so the next nearest neighbor is in the long term, but the one after that is in the short term. And that's exactly the antonym problem that you often get when you look at sort of small local syntactic contexts. And in the next a section of this um, part, I'll actually show you some methods of how you could circumvent these kinds of problems. All right, um, just sort of a quick interesting side note. In our ICML paper, we also looked at scene parsing in images. And the reason was that we feel like there's a similar principle of compositionality going on here. Whereas basically the meaning of a scene image is also a function of sort of smaller regions. And, you know, and how they're combined as parts to form larger objects, and how these objects interact to form a scene that sort of makes semantic sense to us. And the interesting thing now is like, what would be an algorithm for parsing these kinds of images? And the, the neat point is that we can actually use that exact same recursive neural network as we used for natural language parsing. And where you, know, you have input representations, you have vectors, you pipe them through a recursive neural network, you get a score, should I merge them? And you can train the model to say, I want to merge things that are part of the same object. And that same algorithm actually obtains state-of-the-art performance um, on images too, and on uh, scene parsing. And works better than a lot of other probabilistic models um, like conditional random fields or Markov random fields. All right, so that was um, all the theory we need and uh, for the, the parsing task. Now let's look at recursive autoencoders. Essentially, before we needed this super, we needed the trees um, from the Wall Street Journal data set to train the model. Um, but we, and we said you're a good node in a tree if the score is high because we knew you know, what syntactically correct trees look like. Uh, here the idea is that we say it's a good parent vector representation of a phrase underneath if we can actually reconstruct the children vectors. And if you can reconstruct them well, that means the parent hasn't lost all the information that you had um, in the children. And so, just like with the autoencoder that we des described in part one, we now have this kind of autoencoder at every node of the tree. And at every node of the tree, we want to say, well, how well can you reconstruct your children after you pipe them through this informational bottleneck, where you, know, you have n two n-dimensional representation, you map it to n dimensions, and then you map it back to two n. And now, um, in order to, so that is one thing. But that wouldn't solve our antonym problem, right? Because it's, again, just un entirely unsupervised. So we can combine that idea with the idea of the softmax classifiers that we also had in part one, and train that um, where we basically have a weighted combination of this reconstruction error and the cross entropy error that you just get from training standard uh, softmax classifier. And that will actually help us capture sort of antonym problems, and as uh, was introduced by us at UNLP in 2001. So let's look at the task of sentiment detection. It's a you know, really crucial task for a lot of business intelligence, stock trading, and so on. And there's actually an interesting story here of, um, of how important that is, which is that whenever Anne Hathaway brings out a movie, and that movie gets good movie reviews, the, the stocks of Berkshire Hathaway, the company, actually go up a little bit. <laughs> and so people are like, oh, what's going on? And it's obvious to me that you know, there are financial algorithmic trading companies that run automatic sentiment detection and you know, say, oh, positive things about, you know, Hathaway, and then they buy more stocks. And so it's a neat task because it really is important or directly um, to applications. So most methods in a force sentiment uh, analysis start with a bag of words representation. They add linguistic features, and processing, and lexica. And lexica, again, are also a little bit tricky for sentiment because you can say, for instance, surprising. It's a very positive word for movie reviews and book reviews. But then, you know, we want to use that lexicon on car reviews and talk about steering and braking and all the sudden surprising isn't actually so positive anymore, right? So sentiment lexica can be problematic. And also, if you use sort of TF-IDF vector representations, there are certain cases that you can construct that you will never be able to tell apart. For instance, white blood cells destroying an infection and an infection destroying white blood cells. Both of these sentences use the exact same words, and they sort of have the exact same TF-IDF or standard bag of words representation that in your LDA or something would use. But in one, you live, and the other one, you might die. So the sentiment is pretty good. All right, so in this task, we want to be given a short uh, snippet or a sentence um, of a movie review, and then we want to classify that sentence to be a positive or negative movie. Uh, for instance, we have the, the sentence, stealing Harvard from movie title 
doesn't care about cleverness with or any other kind of intelligent humor. You know, again, to a bag of words representation, you might say, oh, you got intelligent, you got humor, cleverness, and wit. So four positive words, but they're all negated uh, through the doesn't care about. And so that should be classified as a negative movie review. And then you know, the phrase, a film of ideas of right comic medium, should be classified as positive. So how do we do on this? So we look at um, the movie reviews data set and another standard data set, the MP2A ones for opinions, and compare, um, this was last year, to a method that used sort of hand-designed polarity shifting rules and sentiment lexicons. So these polarity shifting rules, you know, you have like a tree, and you can say, well, if I see not in front of the positive word, and it gets negative, and so on. And in contrast, our recursive autoencoder really just used the input sentences and the label, and didn't use any hand-designed features. And it actually gets state-of-the-art performance as of last year um, on, on these two data sets. Uh, what's interesting, instead of sort of requiring as input um, sentiment lexica, we can actually ask the model, what do you think are the most sentiment uh, loading words, um, not just single words, but also phrases? So let's look at some examples. So here we have the most negative engrams, just ordered by a probability of how likely they are negative. And you know, the obvious candidate, bad, boring, dull, flat, are very you know, clear candidates, and the model picks those up uh, from the data. Um, Contrast, touching, enjoyable, and powerful are very positive words. Um, I sort of like this bigram, abysmally pathetic. That was one of the most negative bigrams the model thought were in the data set, and you know, a movie really has to suck to say it's abysmally pathetic. Um, of course, uh, for, for trigrams, if you, um, you know, concatenate uh, positive words, funny and touching, and also here for uh, five grams, cute, funny, heartwarming, and so on, those are also very positive. But what's neat again is that the model can sort of abstract a little bit away from sort of the obvious unigram statistics and gives um, a very high probability of being positive to a phrase such as a deeply absorbing piece that works as something. And that's kind of neat. So, so they are, all the single words aren't that positive, but together they form a really positive sentiment and the model can um, pick up some of these things. Um, we can also visualize it. One of the yes. That's a, that's actually a great question. So if we build, sure. Um, so does it matter um, when we combine the words in the tree? And the, the long answer is um, well, maybe we don't have time for a long answer. But essentially, here we're building tree structures that where we don't give it the right uh, the right parse. And so it actually builds a tree structure where it tries to capture as much of the sentiment as possible. So it actually first merges sentimental words and then sort of adds content words on top. And so um, your, your question is, um, the, do the words that you merge last matter more? And yes, of course, they do. So, but, but the words guarantee that you can't merge your Yeah, so it turns out the model actually wants to capture, since you care in your objective function, you care mostly about the reconstruction and the classification, actually in the end tries to reconstruct well those things that it can also class, that it cares about classifying correctly. All right, um, so we can visualize now, again, we project these 50 dimensional word vectors that we have uh, down to two dimensions and Galaxy is very deep as well. Um, We color the words by how probable they, how um, how likely they are at positive or have a positive sentiment. So down here uh, we'll have very negative words, and up here we'll have very positive words. And in this uh, projection, what we'll essentially notice is that, that on the first eigenvector dimension, it aligns sort of the uh, the sentiment of the words. And so when we zoom in here, we see you know this is trained on movie reviews that you know um, tedious, waste, awful, thin, <coughs> stupid, a very negative. And you know, if you talk about movies that just come out on Rotten Tomatoes, movie website, and already mentioned TV, it's also not a good sign. 
Um, then as you move through the space, uh, you sort of get in the center, you get all the contact for, uh, content words, like flag, effects, uh, events, elements, clothes, and so on. And then as you move uh, further up in the space, uh, you get very positive words such as manage the, manages, beautifully, journey, warm, honest, uh, engrossing, and so on. And so you can actually try to make an effort and visualize what these models learn and, and try to interpret it. One of the nice examples is that uh, one of the words up here was actually flawed. And that was kind of surprising. Like, why would flawed indicate uh, pragmatically a positive movie review? And maybe somebody here has an idea why that is. Why do you think flawed appears in positive movie reviews? Nope, it's not the infrequent appearance of it. Yes. People often praise flawed characters. Perfect, exactly. So that is one of the two main reasons. People like flawed characters, because maybe they can associate with them. The other one is uh, that flawed actually only appears with the following but or an although. So like, even though, you know, um, so this, the characters in the movie kind of sucked, but, or uh, the characters, uh, or the story was kind of flawed, but it was his best performance yet. So there's in almost all cases, there's an but or an although that is followed with the flawed. And so uh, I, I have the examples also if people are interested after. All right. So um, that was sort of all new reviews on just a single scale, sort of binary, uh, positive, negative. But of course, human sentiment is much more complex than that. And so uh, in this paper at DMLP last year, we actually introduced a new data set and task uh, based on the experienceproject.com, which is a website where people can give anonymous confessions on the internet. And you know, if you know anything about the internet, you'll get a much broader spectrum of sentiment um, that people write. And so you write um, your confession, and then other people can click on the story and uh, basically say whether they, they're sorry for you or whether they feel like you know, they approve of your actions, say you rock, they thought the story was funny, and click on tee -hee. they're very empathetic, or the, the story's just sort of over the top um, crazy. And so we can now use these stock map classifiers um, on top of the tree structures to try to classify these distributions and not just sort of uh, soft mix with one or two units. Uh, and what we'll get here is, you know, for each story we can now have the goal distribution and the one that our algorithm predicts. And for this story, I'm a very successful businessman, I made good money, but I've been addicted to crack for 13 years. Um, that, you know, most people click on, you know, the story box category and the I understand category, and fortunately not too many think it's a good one. And then, um, in contrast though, uh, for this uh, sentence, uh, most people either approve or maybe as my just now, I uh, think that is going to do. And a lot of the stories sort of on, on that uh, website are by teenagers and talk about unrequited love, and, you know, just as uh, the people who read them, our algorithm is also very empathetic uh, for those kinds of love stories. All right, um, so we can now evaluate how well we do by just sort of predicting the maximum category that we think will get the most clicks, but instead we can also evaluate it by how close the distributions are that, and, and evaluate um, like that. And in both cases, the recursive autoencoder um, gets state-of-the-art performance. You want the small distance uh, in the Kobach Bible divergence to the ground truth distribution, uh, and ours has the smallest on average, and we can also predict the highest cost very accurately. All right, let's move on to the second task. So far, um, there was always a little bit of syntax involved, but uh, this task is interesting paraphrase detection because you want to entirely abstract away from the syntactic structure. So you want to you, know, you have like an active and a passive sentence, and you might have very different syntactic structures, but they might be paraphrases of each other, which means that you know if one is true, then in a similar world, we would assume the other one is true as well. And so these are two examples. You're given uh, two sentences, and you say, yes, they are mutually entailing each other or paraphrase of each other, or they're not. And so the question is, how should we compare the meaning of two sentences? As I mentioned to you before, the vectors that we always learn in these recursive moon networks capture both syntax and semantics. And so if we just took the top vector from, let's say, you know, the cats catch mice and cats eat mice, if we now just take these top vectors, that kind of works, but it doesn't get state of the art performance because these vectors also have syntactic structure in them, but we might not care about that. We really only want to know whether they're semantically similar. So what we did instead in our NIPS paper last year was we introduced uh, a similarity matrix and variable size pooling. And what does that do? Um, you can basically take um, every uh, node and every vector representation of one of the trees 
and compare it in its Euclidean distance to all the other vectors in the other tree. So here, the first row, for instance, uh, compares this capitalized cat to all the other nodes, both uh, the terminal nodes in the tree and the non-terminal nodes of the tree, and looks at how, how close in Euclidean distance they are. And then you get the similarity matrix. But now the similarity matrix depends, its size depends on how many words you had in the two sentences. But ideally, your classifier uh, wants to have fixed size representation. So what we did here is we introduced a very simple idea of taking a variable size rectangle. We always, let's say, we always want to have four, uh, four by four sort of gist of this similarity matrix. So what we did is we took four by four rectangles, and then in each of the rectangles, we take the smallest value. And why it's smallest? Because the smallest value indicates that in this part of the, in this area of the Samaria matrix, um, you have a very close match uh, between the two sentences. And uh, that system essentially gets state-of-the-art performance on the Microsoft Research Paraphrase Corpus, which is a, a corpus that a lot of people have worked on, um, and you know, and part of a very good probabilistic models or um, you know, very well-designed features, uh, surface features, and there's actually a test paper at ACL this year uses a string rewriting kernel, um, and sort of, you know, the, which gives us a nice method to compare to kernel methods, and our unfolding recursive autoencoder gets to the other performance. And um, I mentioned these similarity matrices, and we can actually sort of analyze and look of how, how, what do they capture? What kinds of features are we capturing after we pool them? So here we pool uh, into a 20 by 20 similarity matrix, and we get some very interesting structure in these matrices. Um, on, in this table, the first column shows us whether it is a, paragraph, uh, a paraphrase or not, the two sentences. And the second column uh, gives the probability that our model assigns to these two sentences and whether they're paraphrases. And, and so now we can look at some examples. So for the first one, when you have this very clear diagonal structure, you actually, um, that, that shows us that the syntax and the semantics align very well between the two sentences. So um, the first word here is you know, exactly the same, the second word is the same, and so in the first quadrant here of this matrix, we compare words to other words. In the two off-diagonal quadrants, uh, we compare words to non-terminal phrases, and then and down here, we compare non-terminal phrases to other non-terminal phrases. And so if you get this sort of clue, um, which means the Euclidean distance is very, very small, then that shows that, especially in this quadrant down here, there are even longer phrases that are perfect matches in the two sentences. So the model very accurately says that this is a paraphrase. And uh, similarly, things that aren't paraphrases at all, like the one down here, um, you know, it, it's very obvious to us also that they are not. Um, what's interesting, though, is I mentioned sort of passive active constructions or other constructions where you completely switch the syntactic structure. And this one here is actually a neat example. Um, so the first sentence is, the lies and deceptions from Saddam have been well documented over 12 years. And the second one is actually slightly ungrammatical one, one, but it was in the data set, is it has been well documented over 12 years of lies and deceptions from Saddam. So you have here a complete flip in the syntactic structure. And what that results in is these two off-diagonal elements in the similarity matrix. And the model is very robust to these kinds of changes. And uh, variances of how you could describe the same idea and still assigns a very high probability um, of being paraphrased. And there are other cases where you might think it's not, but the model uh, is able to recover. Um, this one is kind of interesting too. So here you have two sentences, and then in your similarity matrix you have this gap. And maybe again somebody has an idea of why, what does this gap indicate in the similarity matrix? So again, we have like good alignment in the beginning, and then there's good alignment of non-terminal phrases in the end. So we're missing a chunk? Yes, exactly. You're missing the chunk. And that breaks the mutual entailment and the paraphrase relationship. And the chunk uh, that is missing right here is, you know, that Henry Kissinger was an ambassador at large for counterterrorism. And you know, if that if that a second sentence is true, that doesn't necessarily mean um, that the, the first one is true. All right. So um, now we captured sort of um, sentiment analysis and paraphrase detection. Um, the last work I want to talk to you about is uh, compositionality through recursive matrix vector spaces. So um, in all the models that I've shown you, we've used that same function um, parameterized by this one matrix W, so that same neural network layer at every node um, of the tree. 
But some words actually uh, are acting more as operators, such as very and very good. You don't really think that very has sort of an inherent meaning by itself that much. Um, on the other hand, you know, if you assume that good is some kind of vector representation, you might assume that very, for instance, sort of prolonged a vector of goodness. And uh, it's kind of hard uh, to think that one single W could merge all possible um, words and phrases um, properly. And so what we introduced at this year's UNLP paper um, is essentially an extension that assumes that every word is not just a vector with a passive sort of inherent meaning, but also is an operator and has like an active operational meaning uh, encoded as a matrix. And as you merge things in a tree, merge two phrases in a tree, you apply um, the vector, uh, you apply the matrix of one to the vector of the other and vice versa. So here, if very has this vector in this matrix, you apply um, this matrix to the vector of good and the matrix of good to the vector uh, of, of very. And you continue doing that in a tree structure. And I won't go into too many details here because um, you know, I'll give a talk on July 14th, and you will see, please come. <laughs> and um, basically, what we show is that for certain things, um, this matrix vector representation can do much better and can, in principle, do things that uh, other models cannot. Um, so here, we want to predict sentiment distributions. And so on the x-axis, we have how often 